Hi, and welcome to the NCL, or New Centennial Leadership Workshop, Leadership Development 100 Years in the Making. Um, my name is Katie Marks, and I'm going to be walking you through this workshop today. So if at any point you need to stop or go back and review anything, just feel free to do so. So the American Legion, the Auxiliary, the Riders, the Sons, our entire family is something that I'm really passionate about. And I really hope that you'll leave this workshop and have the same passion and excitement that I do every time I go to a meeting, every time I talk with one of our members, one of our 635,000 members. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping this will provide you with the leadership skills, the confidence and the competence to be an ALA rock star. All right, before we get started, I just wanted to quickly review the content for this workshop. Um, and if you could please note that during the workshop, American Legion Auxiliary may be abbreviated to ALA for short. Now, the first half of our workshop will be the ABC, and ABC stands for Auxiliary Basics Course. Uh, within this section, we're going to talk more in depth about our organization's history, the structure of units, and how the unit serves as a foundational base within our American Legion family as well as our organizational structure, programs, protocols, and procedures of conducting business. Now, the second half of this workshop is gonna focus on leadership development. One of the goals of American Legion Auxiliary Leadership is to develop leaders at all levels, and that starts with you. We'll be spending some time taking a personal inventory, recognizing our individual areas of strength, areas needing improvement, and then relating those self-discoveries back to the ABC in what I'll refer to as the NCL 360 so that we can best apply them in our leadership within our organization. As we prepare to dive into the workshop, I really suggest that as you participate, you keep paper or a notebook handy with a writing utensil. There'll be a test at the end of the NCL workshop. This exam, when it's completed, should be sent to your department leadership chairman, who will send you your leadership certification. This leadership certification is contingent upon passing the test, but more importantly, all the notes that are taken during the course of this workshop are great to have on hand as you continue on within the organization. Notes, comments, questions, suggestions, or even anything else you might jot down today are really beneficial to review and reflect on over time, even if you're not currently in a direct auxiliary leadership position. All right, now that we got all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start with the Auxiliary Basics course. During the period of only eight years, from 1921 to 1929, the American Legion Auxiliary grew staggeringly, from 11,000 members to over 200,000 members. This was a significant period of growth for the organization, of new programs for the veterans, and of concern for growing pacifism. It was a time when the auxiliary was needed in America to spearhead the drive of concern for the veterans and to keep the country alert to the dangers of isolationism. When American veterans banded together in the American Legion to carry on a peacetime program of service to the nation, it was only natural for the women of their families to join them. The women who had served so faithfully during the trying days of the war wanted to continue to serve and the auxiliary is a result of that desire. Subsequent to the formation of the American Legion, a number of women's organizations wanted to become the affiliated women's organization of the Legion. A special committee was appointed by the temporary national organization of the Legion to consider these requests. And after careful consideration, the committee determined that a new organization should be made up of the women most closely associated with the men of the Legion. These women would serve the Legion in peace as they had in war. The committee had determined that the best way for the Legion to secure an effective auxiliary would be to build a new organization from the ground up. The auxiliary could then carry forward the phases of Legion activities more suitably performed by women. When the first National Convention of the American Legion was held November 11th and 12th of 1919, the Special Committee reported these facts to the Convention. The report was approved by the Convention, and Article 8, which we'll review in the following slide, was written 
into the Constitution of the American Legion. Section 1 was the recognition of an auxiliary organization by the American Legion. This organization would be known as the Women's Auxiliary to the American Legion. Section 2 outlined membership requirements for the auxiliary, limiting membership to mothers, wives, daughters, and sisters of Legion members, or of men or women who served in the military or naval service between 1917 and 1920. If you'll notice, granddaughters were not yet permitted membership, as this membership extension wouldn't come until a later time. Finally, Section 3 stated that the auxiliary would be governed in each department of the American Legion by rules and regulations set forth by the National Executive Committee and then approved by the appropriate Legion Department. Less than a year later, 1,342 local units of the Women's Auxiliary to the American Legion had been organized. They were scattered all over 45 states. 11,000 members had paid a national per capita tax to the national headquarters of the Legion. However, no departments had been organized within those 45 states. All this had been accomplished by the time the second national convention of the Legion was held in Cleveland, Ohio in September of 1920. After the Cleveland Convention, National Commander John G. Emery issued a directive stating that no department of the auxiliary could be formed until a number of units had been organized that equaled 50% of the number of Legion posts in the department. Thus, department organization began in 1920. Miss Pauline Koenig was employed by the National Headquarters of the American Legion to be in charge of organizing the auxiliary units. Now, she worked as a clerk under the direction of Russell Creviston, the Legion's Director of Organization. Minnesota was the first department to qualify for a charter, and the first department convention was held in Minneapolis on November 18, 1920. By the summer of 1921, enough departments had been organized to permit the National Commander, John G. Emery, to call a national convention of the Women's Auxiliary to be held concurrently with the Legion's third national convention in Kansas City, Missouri. The Auxiliary's first convention convened on November 1st of 1921 with delegates from nearly every state and territory answering roll call. Departments had already been chartered in 42 states and the territory of Hawaii. There were 3,653 units with an enrollment of 131,000 members. During the year following the Legion's second national convention, the Auxiliary grew from 1,342 units to 3,653 units. In Kansas City's Grand Avenue Temple, National Commander Emery called the first session of the Auxiliary's Convention to order. Dr. Helen Hughes Hilscher of Minnesota was elected temporary chairman of the convention. A national constitution and bylaws modeled after that of the American Legion Constitution was adopted, with the insertion of the phrase, to participate in and contribute to the accomplishment and of the aims and purposes of the American Legion. It was at this convention that the name of the organization was officially changed to the American Legion Auxiliary. The organization of the auxiliary was completed in 1921 with the election of Miss Edith Hobart of Cincinnati, Ohio, to lead the organization in its first year. An important action was taken at this convention that has remained with the organization. The poppy was adopted as the memorial flower of the auxiliary. The American Legion had elected to establish its national headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. The Auxiliary established its national headquarters in that city and temporary headquarters. In 1925, the first unit of both organizations moved into a limestone building, occupying the third and fourth floors of that building. The Auxiliary National Headquarters moved from 8945 North Meridian Street, Suite 200 in Indianapolis, Indiana, in 2008, occupying the second floor. Miss Pauline Koenig of Indianapolis joined National Headquarters as the first National Secretary, and Miss M. Azetta McCoy of Topeka, Kansas, became the first National Treasurer. With the help of a staff of 13 employees, the National Secretary and the National Treasurer, activities were launched in the fields of rehabilitation, child welfare, and Americanism. In the year following the first convention, enrollment increased to 190,635 members in 5,375 units. 
Departments were organized in 48 states, the District of Columbia, Alaska, Hawaii, and the Panama Canal Zone 1 in Mexico. In October 1922, the second national convention was held in New Orleans, Louisiana. Dr. Kate Waller Barrett of Alexandria, Virginia was elected national president. The first state's dinner was held at this convention for 1,300 people. During Dr. Barrett's year, auxiliary units did everything in their power for the hospitalized veterans. These services included visiting veterans in hospitals, providing comfort items to the veterans, and providing hospitality to relatives visiting the hospitalized veterans. Dr. Helen Hughes Heelsher, a leader in early rehabilitation work, sounded a call that was the beginning of the Legion's and Auxiliary's long campaign to obtain the best care for the disabled veterans. This effort eventually resulted in the establishment of the Veterans Administration and the development of a system of modern Veterans Administration medical centers. In its third year, Ms. Helen Bishop of Massachusetts was elected national president. During her term, the fight for disabled veterans and for the adjusted compensation bill ended with the enactment over the veto of President Calvin Coolidge. In 1924, children's BAs were established to care for the orphans of veterans. The auxiliary had vigorously been fighting against radicalism and pacifism. Through the efforts of the auxiliary, the first Women's Patriotic Conference on National Defense was held in Washington, D.C. in February 1925. In the same year, strong nationwide support was given to the Legion's campaign to raise a $5,000 endowment fund for rehabilitation and child welfare. The auxiliary was given credit for helping that drive to succeed. The organization continued to grow in 1926 and disabled veterans made 4 million poppies. The auxiliary distributed these, and this represented significant progress in rehabilitation work. The pilgrimage to France for the 1927 National Convention took more than 27,000 Legion and auxiliary members to Europe. With the Leviathan as flagship, the American veterans and family female members crossed the Atlantic in peacetime. The Salvation Army's Donut Girl in World War I Irene McIntyre Walbridge of New Hampshire was elected national president. Under the leadership of national president, Miss Lucy Ficklin of Georgia, the first department presidents and secretaries conference was held in November, 1928 in Indianapolis, Indiana. This conference has proved to be so valuable that it has been held each year since that time. At this time, the auxiliary became a major force behind the pilgrimage of Gold Star Mothers and Widows to France. This pilgrimage was made at government expense. With the passage of the Naval Construction Bill, an important victory was won for national security. And the veterans were not forgotten at Christmas in 1928, as 50,000 hospitalized veterans received gifts from the auxiliary. A new tradition was established at the 9th Annual National Convention of the American Legion Auxiliary when the national president was presented with the stand of auxiliary national colors under which she had served. By 1929, the Great Depression blanketed the country. The threatening conditions tightened the ties of comradeship among veterans and their families. This need to join together resulted in new membership records for both the Legion and the auxiliary. Under a new plan, each department in the organization provided gifts for all the veterans' hospitals in its state, regardless of the home state of the patient. Nearly 60,000 veterans received gifts from the auxiliary under this new system. As the Depression grew worse, aid to unemployed veterans became the first concern of the Legion and the auxiliary. The organizations worked together for a bill to authorize loans up to 50% on adjusted compensation certificates. The World War I bonus was not paid to veterans in cash, but in 20-year insurance certificates called Adjusted Compensation Certificates. The White House blocked the bill. The president vetoed it. The fight continued, and 996,302 unemployed veterans were placed in jobs. Economic conditions brought a reverse in membership figures. For the first time, the auxiliary saw a decline in membership as 9,622 members dropped from the organization. But by the end of 1932, there were only 402,441 members. 
the depression had made it impossible for many members to pay their dues. In 1934, a campaign was launched to make good books available to more Americans. The Community Service Committee, established in 1926, carried out this program for the benefit of millions. The battle of the adjusted compensation certificates continued into 1936. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt vetoed the bill, Congress overrode the veto and it passed. The American Legion and the American Legion Auxiliary won the battle. They were also victorious in their fight for increased national defense spending for more than $1 billion was appropriated to strengthen the Army and Navy. In 1937, the Legion and the Auxiliary held their annual conventions in New York City, the largest and most spectacular convention in the history of the organization. Two and one half million spectators lined the streets of New York City when the 150,000 Legionnaires marched up Fifth Avenue. The gigantic parade lasted 18 hours. When world peace was threatened in the late 1930s, the Legion and Auxiliary continued their demands for a stronger national defense. Although World War I had occurred 20 years earlier, the needs of the disabled veterans of that war were increasing in 1937 and 1938. In that auxiliary year, the first area rehabilitation conferences were held, with short course of instruction given by veterans hospitals in 15 states. In 1938, the auxiliary began to grow again, and membership reached a high of 460,919. The half million mark was in sight. The largest Christmas program for veterans took place in 1938 with gifts from the auxiliary sent to 94,654 hospitalized veterans and to 25,293 families of veterans. The program cost $236,902 not a small sum as the country struggled out of the depression. The year 1939 was a year of beginnings and Kansas and Nebraska shared honors for a first in the girl state program. This was the year that VA hospital gift shops program began spreading quickly to all departments, becoming a part of the rehabilitation program. Congress suddenly adopted national defense measures advocated by the auxiliary for years. In 